Hi there. Thanks for joining in today and welcome on board if it's your first time. We are today exploring Q2 episode 6 part 1. A topic captioned the two witnesses. Let's get into it. Two witnesses. Who exactly are these people and why are they important? Well, we about to find out. Revelation 11 begins with a very interesting approach. Now, while in a vision, John the Revelator was giving what looked like a measuring rod with specific instructions, go and measure. What exactly am I measuring? Well, I'm glad you asked, John. Go measure one, the temple of God together with the altar. Two, all the worshippers in the temple, but for now, exclude the outer court and a particular group of people who seem to have a bond to pick with me. They're called the Gentiles. What do these texts suggest again? Well, if someone said they were measuring you, they better be your tailor or fashion designer, or they must be assessing you. One word that best encapsulates this whole illustration is judgment. And the text suggests that it begins in the house of God. Let that settle. After this sin, God tells Brother John, I will appoint two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. Um, so how did we get here again? And who are these guys in a way? Well, that's a good question. And trust me, there'll be many more unknown characters popping into the scene down the line. So this might be a good time to set some ground rules. And here's one of them. As we embark on our journey through the prophetic writings of Daniel and Revelation, we will discover that amidst the ambiguity of certain characters, there are some subtle descriptive clues scattered throughout the text that if decoded properly, will unveil their true identity of these characters and give clarity to the text. So, our first task is to identify who these two witnesses are. And here's our workflow. One, identify the clues about these two witnesses. Two, decode them. Number three, use them to identify the character, then interpret the text. Let's get started. So please read with me Revelation chapter 11 from verse 3 to 6, and let's begin with identifying the clues. I'll read. I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in slackcloth. They are the two olive trees, and the lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during that time that they are prophesying. And they also have the power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of flakes as often as they want. Let's start from the bottom and work our way up. Clue number one. They can turn water into blood and smite the earth with plagues. Does that sound familiar? How about Moses in his encounter with Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 7? I'm sure he did those things. Now, hold that thought while we explore clue number two. It says they can prophesy and keep rain from falling as long as they predict. Does anyone come to mind? How about Elijah? 
You recall his encounter with King Ahab and Jezebel the Queen in 1 Kings 17 and 18 and also in James 5 verse 17. Now, in both cases, it was by the word of God that these feats were achieved. So, these two witnesses must have something to do with the word of God, chronicled in the Bible as the Old and New Testaments. Now, clue number three suggests that those who seek to harm these two witnesses will be consumed by fire that comes from your mouth. Now, to make sense out of clue number three, let's consider another basic principle of Bible interpretation. And read, when the complete interpretation of a concept or principle is not made clear, from a text or chapter. Resist the urge of filling in the blank spaces with speculations or self-opinion. Let the Bible interpret itself always. But how do I do that? Well, refer to somewhere else in the Bible where the same topic is discussed and you will most likely find supplementary facts and or principles for clarity line upon line precepts upon precepts a little here a little there isaiah 28 verse 10. so let's do that let's consider jeremiah chapter 5 with particular attention to verse 14. now preceding this pronouncement the people of god had drifted far away from god and his words so prophet jeremiah attempted to intervene bring him back to the attention the words of God, but they rebuffed both the prophet and the word of God, saying, God will do nothing. No harm will come to us. The prophets are back wind and the word is not in them. And in verse 14, God responds in judgment. And this is what God says, because the people have spoken these words, I will make my words in your mouth a fire, and this people wood it consumes. Meaning, all who have refused and rejected the word of God will be judged by these same very words that they have rejected. Now this decodes clue number three. Clue number four, in comparison with Zechariah 4, the two witnesses are likened to the olive trees and the job was to recharge the lamps with oil to keep the flames burning. Now we know that oil is symbolic for the Holy Spirit. So whoever these witnesses are, part of your job was to in alliance with the Holy Spirit of God to illuminate dispelling darkness. Clue number five, witnesses. They are witnesses of God and they stand before his presence in reference to their immutability. Now you will recall in John chapter five verse 39, while referring to the Old Testament, Jesus said in very clear terms, these are they that testify about me. Something the two witnesses will do. Also in Matthew 24 verse 14, Jesus de again declares that the gospel of the kingdom, the Old and the New Testament will be preached as a testimony to nations. In summary, it is therefore safe to assume that the two witnesses being referred to here is the word of God chronicled in the Bible as the Old and the New Testaments. The word of God proclaimed in the power of the Holy Spirit to lighten the world, dispelling darkness, especially during the dark ages. Question. Think about it. Why is the adversary so bent on discrediting or eradicating the Bible? Why, why, why go through all this pain for this long? Think about it this way. The sense of orientation of a traveler 
equipped with a GPS alone. In a strange land, and his hope of ever making it home is hugely dependent on the integrity of his GPS. So, if its true nav gets compromised, the chances of making it home becomes very slim. In the same vein, even if this GPS works perfectly fine, but the traveler, for whatever reasons, refuses to use it, the outcome is not any different, and the devil knows that. So here is the conclusion of the matter. The Bible has been preserved as chronicles of God's opinion on issues eternal and physical and as our standard of reference for truth to guard against all concussions of error flooding our spaces today it is not enough to have them in our shelves in our iPhones or any manner of iners it would only benefit them they use it so your choice and i sincerely hope that we all choose right so what about the 1260 day time prophecy oh that sure let's catch up in part two for more details make sure to check it out okay and that's it for part one make sure to check out part two for the conclusion of this series um, thanks for joining in today. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. It's your Sebastian Doodle, doodling out. I'll see you in part two. Bye.